what we're doing actually this summer is we're looking at stories. Another word for story is narrative, and they're people that describe uh, narrative theology is when we look at the stories of the Bible, not to say that they're make-believe because they're not, it means that they're so full and rich and thick, be so much more to story than just simply words. And so we're taking a look at this one named Jesus that's at the very center. And so uh, if it's okay, I'd like to tell you a story today. So we're going to look at a passage of the Bible that tells a story actually of three people. Um, it's in Mark chapter 5. If you're kind of new to the Bible, you can look it up yourself in your pew Bible, page 1563, and don't be embarrassed, that's okay. But for all of us here, I'm going to read it, and you can follow along. If you're able, I invite you to stand to receive what God has for us by reading what he has handed down to us. This is a, a story, an event that's recorded in also Matthew chapter 9 and Luke chapter 8. But it's unique in Mark, so we'll take Mark 5, starting at verse 21. Here we go. When Jesus had crossed again over uh, by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, a guy named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with them, my, my little daughter's dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus... She snuck up behind him in the crowd and, and touched his cloak because she thought, if I, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? <clears throat> but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your trust has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Have a seat. What a story. There's actually two people's story besides the one at the center, Jesus. In this, there's the woman, there's this guy named Jairus. We're going to talk more about Jairus next week. We're going to look at what happens after what we've just read in the life of Jairus and his daughter and his family. But this week, we're going to look at the woman and Jesus. What we notice here, they come by boat and get to the other side of the lake, and, and people quickly found out who he was. His fame had already spread rapidly rather early in his work. And uh, so people gathered, a lot of people gathered, a great crowd. And as they gathered, one guy was there who had come just in the nick of time because he realized, he heard somehow that Jesus had arrived and his little girl was just about to die right on the brink of death. And I got a little girl, so she's 30, but she's still my little girl. And uh, I get why a dad would come, would come running when hearing that this one who already everyone knew was absolutely unique. So he, he falls down in front of him and he pleads, will you please come? She's dying. So Jesus goes off with him, and that's when this woman enters the story. There's a couple of things here. First of all, as they're going, the crowd pressed into him. That's what we just read. The crowd did not press forward to help Jesus get to Jairus. They were not thinking about Jairus and his family. 
they were thinking about they're near a really powerful, popular guy. It's kind of like when you see somebody famous somewhere, whether here in Orange County. I've been in L.A. most of my adult life, three years. And, <clears throat> and I've, I've run into people, you know, Henry Winkler, maybe B list for you, but that's pretty big for me. Hey, okay. And when he went to Starbucks once, I never, you know, all, everybody's taking these selfies, pretending like they don't notice him, and there he is, and then, like that. And uh, give a Sharpie to their four-year-old, sign my forehead, will you? And, you know, I mean, to, just to be around somebody kind of famous, that's what the crowd seemed to be doing. They were pressing into him. This is a unique word in the Greek that it's not helping him move, it's pushing into him. So all these people are touching Jesus. You got to know that. So as they're pressing in and they continue to move, here comes this woman. We know Jairus' name. He's a big shot. He's powerful. He's a synagogue president. Everybody respected him. Everybody knew him. Here's this woman. We don't even know her name. We don't know where she came from. But here she is. Somehow she had arrived on the scene, and we hear about her story. Twelve years before this, like other Palestinian women, she had her monthly cycle. Almost certainly that's what's going on here. She had her monthly cycle, and, and so she would do what ancient people groups did, especially in that part of the world. They would be ceremonially unclean, so they couldn't touch another person because by touching another person, they would make them unclean as well. So they would go away into their own place or tent with other women who were going through the same monthly cycle, and this was a very normal part of their life together, and they would be there for a few days, and their friends would come in, and then their friends would leave, and she'd still be there. And then another friends, and they'd keep rotating through, and she wasn't getting better. So eventually, she had to somehow meet with a village priest, who I'm sure kept his distance, and she had to say, what's happening? And he would say, well, we're not really sure, but we do know you're unclean, and you remain unclean, so you have to leave. And so we don't know where she was from, but we do know that she had to leave her town, her family, leave human touch, probably human relationships as well. Luckily, she had some resources, you know? She had some money. So it gave her hope. Her resources gave her hope to find her healing. And so she went from doctor to doctor to place to place, from quack to quack, to just try to figure out, will you help me? Will you help me? Yeah, pay up front. And she went through all her money, and nothing helped. Twelve years. What we do know, but we don't know why, is that twelve years is really interesting. Because she suffered for twelve years. And Jairus' little girl was twelve years old. Twelve years of joy, desperation. Twelve years of pain and suffering. But more than that, not just the hemorrhaging, but the isolation, the loneliness, the sense that my new name, my new label is unclean. I've got no place to go. I've got no hope. But the line there, the, an amazing line, she heard about Jesus. We don't know how. Maybe she's on the crest of a hill and sees the boat coming, sees a crowd running, and perhaps while she's trying to forage for food or get some clothing from nice people, traveling town to town, not really being able to touch them or be near them, she heard that this is the one everyone was talking about. So she thought, this is my chance. Here's her story. So she goes into the crowd. She breaks the law. She's a lawbreaker. Who has compassion on a lawbreaker? Who cares about the unclean? But the people were so consumed pressing into Jesus, they didn't even notice. What a wild scene. If I could transport you there, if we could go together, and where would we be standing? Maybe some of us would be friends of Jairus and be kind of trying to hurry him along. Maybe some would be standing near the disciples because we heard about them trying to get kind of close to the entourage. Maybe others are just on the outskirts kind of looking. Where would you be? But here's this woman, and she realizes that Jesus has power. She trusts his power. So she sneaks in, and she starts touching people to get in. She's making them unclean, but they don't seem to notice. 
because she thought that I can't interrupt him, I'm nobody. He's with this important guy, this Jairus fella. He's on a mission for this 12-year-old daughter. I, I can't stop him. So what's my next option? I'm just going to try to sneak up kind of behind him. I'm not worthy of interrupting him, but if I can just touch the edge of his cloak, then I'll be healed. She believed in that power. And then what happened? Here's my favorite word in the Bible. I've told you guys this before. Maybe you haven't heard this yet. But every time this word comes up and we're talking about it, I'm going to share it again because this is the greatest word. Here's the word. Ready? It's in verse 29. See it right there? The very first word. It's a great word. Immediately. That is a great word. You know why? As soon as you say it, it's too late. <laughs> it's done. Immediately done. So, oops. Immediately. Say it fast. Doesn't matter, it's over. As soon as she touched him, the second she touched him, there was power that came out of Jesus. He felt it somehow. We're not sure exactly what took place. We're not sure if anybody else noticed, but she felt that power go immediately to her place that needed healing in her body, and it all came together. She was healed, and she knew it instantly. Wow. Wow. End of story. Close the Bible. Let's pray. Thanks for coming. <laughs> but that's not how the story ends. It's, it's actually a little odd. It's odd because it ought to be done. She had figured it out. If I take my money for 12 and I pay somebody, then maybe somebody will heal me, and then I can be healed, and I can go back to my life. There will be no scars from the past. There will be no lingering sadness that I was so isolated for so long, that I was treated differently simply because of this thing that I was experiencing. No, all I need is to have my body healed, and then life will be fine. See, that's kind of what we think. She had figured it out. That's the deal. But Jesus, see, he knew better. He knew her better. So he felt this power, and he knew what had happened. Don't mistake the fact that when Jesus turns around in the crowd and says, who touched me, that he didn't know. Because you look at the record of Jesus Christ in the scriptures and you realize he knew exactly who touched him. He knew exactly who she was. He knew more thoroughly than she did her story. And yet he knew she needed far more than her body to be healed. So he whips around in the crowd, and he says, who touched me? Well, in the disciples, this is, this is kind of amazing. What if we're standing there, you know, and we're watching the disciples, and the people are pressing in, and Jesus stops when the crowd is, and it's a big crowd, and they're pressing in, and all of a sudden he stops, and he whips around in the crowd. It became sheer chaos. People are falling. They're backing up. They're frightened. Because this one all of a sudden took center stage. Jairus and the drama of his daughter was what had stirred up everybody as they're moving forward in the presence of Jesus, certainly. But when he stopped and turned around, the gravitas about his presence took center stage. And you can just see the crowd backing up, people standing up wondering, what do you mean who touched you? And so the disciples get together. I love how Mark puts it. This is so great. The disciples answered. Did you see that? That's exactly what it says. The disciples answered. Now, let me tell you, there's 12 of them. 12 of them. Jesus turns around the crowd, hurrying for Jairus. Jairus' his friend saying, come on, let's go. And the disciples pulled, as if the disciples actually, fellas, come here. Come on, guys, gather around. We have a session meeting. That's what we do, Presbyterians, all right? Vote on stuff. It's what it sounds like there. But when you read the Gospel of Luke, the same event, what you realize is it's actually Peter. Peter, I mean, people say tradition tells us that Peter dictated the Gospel of Mark to John Mark. And so maybe when he's dictating this part, he says to John, to John Mark, he says, okay, now that we all turn and we all started asking Jesus, why did you say this? And I can just hear John Mark going, oh, Peter, I, wasn't that? You? Uh, no, no, it's all of us. Just write it down. Would you? <laughs> I think that's a very interesting thing because that happens a lot in Mark. But in the Gospel of John, it's Peter. So Peter takes the lead. 
however they did it. But they argued with Jesus. Did you ever notice that? His disciples did not understand what he was doing and did not agree with what he was doing. Why would he stop when Jairus is so needy when this girl's about to die? That's irresponsible, Jesus. You are doing something that doesn't fit where we're going. You are saying something that is outside the box. Three weeks ago, when I was preaching this sermon, I invited you and the whole congregation, all four services, and I hope some of you have actually taken me up on this, and our staff, to take this summer and do a little tiny discipline. It's a little tiny thing. Because we're taking a hard, careful look at this one named Jesus. We're taking an unfiltered look at listening to him and seeing him. And the best way to listen to him is to take Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's called the the Sermon on the Mount. And I've invited three weeks ago, and we're going to continue to do this all summer, that the entire congregation and staff reads once a week the three chapters, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7, known as the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest moral discourse in human history. No one has ever matched the kind of thinking and expression of how to live a moral life on behalf of others than Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. But it will throw you off. It will, the more you read it, the more you're going to wonder, really? And I, I hope you're doing that. If you haven't started, it's not too late. Start doing it. And do it once a week. And I actually have invited the congregation saying, I I get a a lot of opportunities. I love this to meet so many that call St. Andrew's home. But I've kind of resolved myself. I'm not going to really talk about how to fix this place in these conversations unless people are actually reading Matthew 5, 6, and 7 before they walk in. So then we can say, that's an awesome idea, but what does that have to do with Matthew 5, 6, and 7? What is Jesus actually telling us? Why would we do that? Because it's a little novel to put Jesus Christ at the center of such a big organization. But that's where we're going. And so in this, that's what the disciples did. I've been a disciple a long time. And i got to be honest with you guys. I've argued with Jesus. Now, I haven't done it out loud very often. But I've read what he said. I've seen what he's done. And I've wondered when I go through my life that I think i got a better plan. And that's exactly what those disciples did. They argued with him. But here's what's great about the Lord Jesus Christ. We get to know him when he took center stage. Three things happen that we see. That's what we're doing. We're looking at characteristics of the king. First thing is this. When he whips around the crowd and he stands at the center and says, who touched me? He demonstrates this. Jesus, Jesus Christ is resolute. Now, that may not be a word you use very often, but it's a really great word. I'm resolved. I've decided. I'm committed. I'm dedicated. There's another word that we use in the church a lot, faithful, but it has lost its teeth. It's a great word if we dig into it, but this idea of being resolute. When Jesus turned around in the crowd and the crowd backed up, and especially the woman is frightened as she got trembling with fear, the scripture says, he was absolutely resolute. He was center stage. His stature grew, and everyone knew that they were standing in front of someone that was absolutely unique, at least in their history. They'd never seen anyone like Jesus Christ. Have you? Have I? Jesus Christ is resolute. You know why? He knew that that woman was not healed yet. Because she had been beaten down by 12 years of being an outcast. Of having her story held closely to her vest. Of being impoverished and imprisoned by her circumstance in a culture that simply had no compassion for the broken. That is a common aspect of human history that the masses often don't have compassion for the broken. And that woman needed more than just physical healing, so Jesus was resolute. He stood tall. No disciple was going to interrupt his mission 
to bring hope and healing and transformation to this woman. She didn't even have a name. That's the second thing about him. He waited. Oh my gosh, what if you're with Jairus? And Jairus is looking at his sundial, just hurry. Whoever touched Jesus, raise your hand, let him forgive you. Let's go. And somehow he just stood there. And even though the disciples at first seemed to question him, even they hung back. And the drama of that moment began to unfold. This woman, knowing it was her, trusted his power, but did not trust his character. But she was totally busted, laid bare, and she came out from the shadow of the crowd and threw herself down before Jesus. There's two lines in this text. You can see are exactly the same lines. It was Jairus, he comes and fell at his feet. And then later, you read, the woman came and fell at his feet. But the actual word of fell is, uh, is, is different for the two. The first one is the typical, I'm going to fall at your feet, I'm going to bow before you, I'm going to ask you for something. That's what Jairus did. It's pipto. Pipto. Jairus came and he piptoed before Jesus and he pleaded with him. That's what happened. With the woman, she also fell at his feet, but the word is pros pipto. Pros means I'm not only going to fall at your feet, I'm going to fall into you. It's, it's a a word that's more desperate, a word that's more profound, a word that has way more emotion attached to it. As this woman came forward, the scriptures tell us, trembling with fear. Can you imagine if you were standing there watching this unfold, this woman trembling with fear, but he, she knows it's her, so she throws herself literally at his feet, maybe almost knocking him over. And all we see is the scriptures say she told him the whole truth. That's what the Bible says. She told him the whole truth. Now, that's a little too sanitized for what's actually going on. And so in the message by Eugene Peterson and in another translation by a guy named J.B. Phillips, even 30, 40 years before that, here's how J the message puts it. The woman gave him the whole story. Here's why this matters. Because it's not like she's trembling with fear and says, I'm the one that touched you, that's it. It's really what happened is she unfolded for him the gift of her story. Something happened when she came trembling with fear to unleash her story. It doesn't say what happened. But knowing the character of Jesus, I am absolutely convinced that he at least got down on one knee. Maybe he sat down right next to her. Because you don't go from trembling with fear to talking about the pain of your private story. It had to unfold. Somehow the eyes of love have built a bridge to her heart. And she handed him her story. Why is this so important? Is because as she handed him her story. He was patient with her. He waited for her to somehow trust him enough to take the fullness of who she is and hand it to this one who has come. Christianity is not about religion. It's not about a series of morals. The morals come out of what God wants to do is he transforms us. But the transformation that takes place only occurs when we hand him our story. He is the one to change us. He is the one to heal us. He is resolute to bring healing and hope. And it's not limited to physical healing, but it's the fullness of who we are, who she was. He was patient because she needed more than physical healing. She needed connection. She needed to know that she had arms to fall into. She needed to find the hope of the one who had come that she knew somewhere in the depth of her soul that it wasn't about her. It had to, be about, had to be about him. And then what did he do? He listened to her. Jesus is resolute. Jesus is patient. As we inch our way through the crowd and lay our lives before him, 
and hand him the gift, as fragile as it is, our story. He may be 15 years old, but you got a story that matters. You may be 85, and you got a story that you can sing to us, Roger. We have a story that's precious to us, and what do we do with this text? We know we have a God who's resolute to lift us up, to heal us, and to transform us into the people we're created to be. It is in Him that all of life is found. He is a center stage. And yet He turns around in the crowd, arguing with any that would, would push against, and He says, I want to know who wants to touch me, who wants to be with me. Come. He's patient. But once we come, I'm convinced he may have held her hand, but he waited her out and he listened to her story. What do we do with this? Well, for some of us, even here, I don't know where you'd be standing in that crowd if you were there, but maybe you know you've never actually handed the fullness of your life story to Jesus. It's, it's not about religion. It's not about Christianity. It's about you and this one on a dusty road. Me too. And if you know you've never given your story to Christ, the fullness of who you are, handed it as a gift to him, where you've handed your life to him so that he can take it and fold it into his story and lift you high. That's your first step. That's what you do with Jesus Christ. It's just like that woman did. You trust him enough with your story, with your life, with your dreams, with your plans, with your hopes, with your failures, with your pain. For the rest of us, we have to remember that that really is the beginning posture of what it means to be a follower of Christ. That it starts with not arguing with him on the road when he does something we don't understand, but simply join him in his resolve. That's St. Andrews. We're a community of people that are representing him as we follow him with his resolve. That's what the human trafficking meeting is about after this service. That's what it means to be followers of Christ when we look around our world, when we look around our neighborhood, when we look around our family, and we recognize that people are longing to be held by Jesus, to have their stories be taken and folded into His. Our task as followers of Christ is to join Him. That's where I would be reading Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We read at the end of it, Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my fathers in heaven. Once you have handed your story to Jesus, once you're a Christian, although I hate the label, then we join him. We stand with him. We may not understand him. We not, may fully agree with everything he says and does, but we join him and we represent him. That's what we do with this. We let him be center stage. May you hand your story to Jesus Christ. Amen. When the woman was finished telling her story, Jesus gave her a new name. He called her daughter. Daughter, it is your trusting in me that has brought you healing. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. It is your trust in Jesus Christ that will set you free and change your life. You don't have to wait till the night. You don't have to wait for a week or a year. You can come and lay before the king and tell him your story even today. Stay. If you want somebody to pray, you can go in the prayer room. You can be alone. 
We talk about it afterwards. But go knowing that the king has invited you into his arms. And go knowing that he calls you son and calls you daughter. Tell him your story and let him set you free. Amen.